Good day, everybody. This is Kevin Hogan, author of 22 books in, uh, what now, 41 languages all across the world. This is the Kevin Hogan channel. Our guest today is Scott Bell, Scott Sylvan Bell. Scott, what is your URL here on YouTube if they want to get Scott Bell Consultant. Scott Bell Consultant. So you want to go there. And by the way, at Scott Bell Consultant, there's what, like four or five videos that people can watch? <laughs> is that about right? Close to about 600 on this channel. 600 on the Scott Bell Consultant channel. Yes. What are people going to learn if they go to the Scott Bell Consultant <clears throat> channel? Uh, general persuasion tactics. Okay. Uh, sales tips. All right. Some marketing. A little bit of body language. Okay, cool. That's a lot of videos. You don't need 600 videos. I've got like 69. Yeah. So, so what? What's the thing with 600? Why 600 videos? Uh, having that many videos on one channel allows me to duplicate myself. So it's like having 600 doors knocked on any given day of the week, any time of the day. Uh, someone can go and look up something on YouTube about sales, and more than likely, if it's a keyword, they're going to find me and just about every topic for sales that there is. So somebody was looking for a sales trainer, then obviously there's a good chance they'll come for you. If they're yeah. looking for a sales tip, there's a good chance they're gonna find Scott Bell, and they might not find Kevin Hogan. Let me make a <laughs> note here about that. Okay, that's pretty good. We are taping live, by the way, here at the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas. It is in October, and we do have an audience today, so if you hear a little woohoo, wow, I never thought of that one yeah. before. It is real, and we didn't put a soundtrack on in the background. <laughs> Um, self-sabotage. You and I were talking about self-sabotage the other day. Salespeople do what we'll call sales sabotage, and you wrote the book. Let me see if I got the title here. Sales sabotage, the most common sales presentation mistakes made. Is that right? Yeah. How long did it take you to put the book together? I've been working on the content for five years. Five years. Yeah. Now, what took you so long? Uh, it's a lot of information. Okay. And fortunately for me, I get to write with salespeople every day. And I wanted to encompass uh, the real issues that salespeople have on a daily basis. So you're writing with salespeople, and, and that's what, in the heating and air industry? Heating and air, plumbing, roofing, electrical. Uh, there's about four different disciplines that I work with them. And you are their trainer, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so, what, so I'm writing with you, and you're going to watch me talk to the man, the woman, whoever I've got to... You know, I'm here to either look at their furnace, the, uh, try to figure out what I'm going to do. Maybe they need a new one. Maybe they don't. Let's sure. say that they do. So are you talking when we go into the house together or am I talking? What's happening there? You're, you're the main event. Okay. I'm just a fly on the wall. Right. And so my only job is to sit there and watch. And very rarely, unless somebody gets in trouble where they don't know how to answer a question, I'm not even looked at. Got it. Um, I do a couple of things. I just I put myself off to the side. I play on my cell phone but I'm paying attention and listening to what the person's doing the whole time. So as you observe people, how do they, let's look at people who make mistakes, sure. okay? Because most salespeople have days where they're hot, everything's on fire, those are the days are memorable, they have no idea what they did right. They also have a lot more days that are not so perfect, Sure. okay? So let's start with the tough days. So how could I screw up a sales process often enough to have a really bad day, week, month? What can I do to go wrong? Okay, so first off is going to be personal influence. Yeah. Um, if there's somebody in the person's life, maybe uh, a friend that's always negative or always has a problem. Uh, I've seen so many salespeople that were right into the call, they're driving, and they're in a good mood. And just before they get to the sales call, they get the phone call, and they talk to that person, it just it crashes everything they have going on. So the, the cell phone and the person's family, friends, sure. <laughs> network, yeah. whatever you want to call it, can literally take a great day and turn it down. Correct. How often do you see it turn it up? Very rarely. So if you were gonna advise somebody, okay, you got your cell phone, we all love our cell phone on sometimes, right? Yeah. But really, I mean, is that is there ever a time when you should, I mean, aside from if somebody's in the hospital, is there ever a time a salesperson should have their cell phone on? With them in a call? Yeah. No. Okay. No, and, and that, that'll mess up a call too. Yeah. You and I are in the middle of talking and you're about to do paperwork and ring, ring the phone. And then I've actually seen salespeople pick up the phone and answer it in a call. Okay, that would probably not <laughs> yeah. be ideal, I would think. <laughs> not at all. Okay, so that's one way we can screw up um, and, and start sales sabotage. What about people who go into streaks of 10 days or two weeks? What's causing stuff like that? So part of that is not having goals. Okay. Okay, so somebody who's not really prepared mentally to be in that sales call. Okay. Um, Wait, tell me what that means. Can you get, uh, explain oh, that? Okay, so let's say that I had uh, $150,000 that I wanted to sell this month. All right. I know that I want to do $150,000. I talk to a lot of salespeople and I'll say, well, what's your goal for the week? Well, I don't have one. Okay, well, what's your goal for the month? I don't have one. All right, let's go a little bit bigger. What's your goal for the year? I don't have one. Got it. And so they, they self-sabotage themselves because they don't even know what they want. 
they just they're flying by the seat of their pants they're going into a sales call and hopefully they get it and in your experience do you find that people that have targets or goals or ranges do do, do they really do better or is that just positive thinking bogus nonsense um, at first I thought it was the hocus pocus bogus, bogus stuff that yeah. you're talking about but it's really not you have to have an they me have to have an internal drive of why we want to do what we do and when you're watching people sell are different can different personalities sell can can we do this guy do real well and he's kind of a shy person versus this guy extrovert over here sure I mean, just the personalities across the board if, if the person lives up to whatever their their strength is instead of focusing on everybody's told me that I need to do this and I need to do that that just be themselves so talk to me about the difference between um, we were talking about going with your gut when you're selling versus what the sales trainer told you. You're sure. the sales trainer, man. You've done how many hours of sales training with ride-alongs and uh, all five that? years times about eight hours a day. That's a lot of people. Ten months out of the year, sixteen thousand yeah. something yeah. hours. So you've got more experience out there doing sales training than probably anybody I know in the world. So my gut feeling tells me I should do this at this house today. Okay. And you told me I should actually do that. What do I? Re what really is the? What is the real answer here? Okay. What's comfortable to you? I mean, we can go through all the trainings and tactics and everything possible, but if it's uncomfortable for you, it's going to come out wrong. Okay. Uh, that person's going to pick up on it and they're going to feel it. They're going to they're going to feel like mm, something's a little bit off about Kevin today. Right. And it may just be that you know we work on your script and we script out in bullet points more than anything else. Than me saying you have to say this word for word. Very rarely are there scripts unless it's like a legal. Uh, issue that have to be done exactly word for word and when I train with guys specifically there's probably one or two questions out of an hour an hour and a half worth of work that they need to do that have to be said in one exact way do you ever run into the sales maverick who is just like awesome even though he's totally off script and totally yeah 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 and you know what a lot of times that guy I, I worked with one of those guys in San Diego on Monday and meeting him I, I would think to myself you know Ten years back, there's no way this guy sells. He just he says what he's thinking. He's kind of brash, but people love him. People, when they saw him, they hadn't seen him for a couple of weeks, hugged him, and he just he said what he was thinking, and people, you know, they liked that about him. And That's I, cool. Yeah, I would have never thought ten years back. Today I would, but ten years back I would have never thought that would have worked. Okay, and you as a sales trainer, what is your key concern when somebody gets into a slump? There, you know that they've been sort of screwing things up. What are the two or three top ways aside from the cell phone ringing? What are the top? Th what What are the three causes of sales sabotage? What's going on there? Okay, so first off is when somebody's struggling and they call and say, "Hey, Scott, I need a ride along." Yeah, and they could be anywhere in the United States. Um, the first question I ask is, "What's changed in your life?" Okay, do you have a new boyfriend? Do you have a new girlfriend? Do you have a new husband? Do you have a new wife? Did you lose something of significant value? Did you just gain something of significant value? Okay, those are going to be the first things that I take a look at because that's going to be the first area where focus is going to change. And even for entrepreneurs, it doesn't have to just be a salesperson. An entrepreneur runs into the same issue. Okay, so let's pause there for a second then. Let's look at that. So if a person's got a new relationship or they're out of an old relationship or whatever you want to call it, so something is different. Yeah. All right, well, that's not going to change because I talk to you and I'm your salesperson. So what am I going to have to do? What are you going to tell me to do differently than I was doing seven hours ago just now that you know the answer? So there's a little bit of therapy that has to go on on my part to ask them what's going on and sometimes people don't realize that that's what the problem is they don't realize that's what's going on it's an aha moment for them They're, oh my goodness I never thought of that I never thought that you know my girlfriend my wife my husband my boyfriend was gonna give me that much influence on what's going on today to make my sale or not make my sale so just that awareness itself can that bring people into maybe a an awareness state or a learning state to where they go oh you know and then what would you offer next though what, what do you would what do you, how do you get them back on track? So there's a couple things. First up, people don't dress up enough. So there's a certain thing that happens when, like, if I dress up in a suit, I feel a lot better about myself. Mm -hmm. So one of my first things of advice for them to do is, I don't care where they go, but just dress up. Right. Just get that out of the way to feel good, confident about what's going on. And then um, get some exercise. That's yep. probably going to be the next thing. And then just realize that, you know, uh, we have a good common friend, Bob Beverly. Yeah. And everybody's broken. We all have experiences that we go through in life. And just recognize that, you know, there's definitely times where things are going to be tough. And, you know, just people need to hear that they're going to be okay. Okay. They just want to hear, hey, you know what, Kevin? I know things aren't going too well right now. You're going to be all right. You're good at what you do. And usually that will just get them to, to pop up enough to, to make that next sell. 
and that puts them back on track. Yeah, that's, that's pretty track. cool. What else, aside from the relationships, aside from the cell phone ring, and we got a couple of cool things here that are helpful, but what am I doing? What could I be doing tactically or um, with, with, a, with my clients that I, I might, what could I, what's a common screw up that I could, sure. I could be making after 10 years of doing, being in the business? So there's a huge difference between reacting and responding. Okay. Okay, reacting is gonna be, I've been through a ton of sales training, and you ask me a question, and before that question's even out of, my, out of your mouth, I'm already got the answer going. And it doesn't feel conversational. Um, I, I have a huge problem with most sales training that's not conversational because it takes the comfort element out of what's going on between me and the buyer or you and I. And so that's probably one of the first things is, is people who think that like I have to have a canned response and it's got to sound exactly this way and I got to say it this quick. Normal conversations don't work that way. There's ebbs and flows. There's, there's quiet periods. There's, you know, there's points where the, the pitch of the voice picks up. But a lot of times, there's a lot of nervous energy to somebody giving uh, uh, an answer to an objection. So, are you sitting there saying, "You know what? I watched you on the last call. What would, what might, how, how might you point that out to that person, to that salesperson?" I, I would uh, take them to the vehicle. That's where we're going to go over to the office, and I'd say, "Hey, I've noticed three points because any time that I'm training with somebody, most people can handle up to three issues. Okay. So, I got to pick my battles." So whatever the top three issues are, I'm gonna target. If I see a, a pattern with writing with a person, I'm gonna keep targeting the next one down. So uh, first off, if the person What do you notice? Like, do you typically notice that people have changed or improved in some way? Do they generally feel better about that after having that awareness conversation with you? They usually do. They usually, that's why you can only target maybe three things at one given time for them to fix. If it's too yeah. many, they become over, overwhelmed and they're like, I'm just not gonna do it. So, so it's, it's the, the, whatever the most important thing is on the list. And is that the big thing? Is that the, so we've got the, we've got the context of the conversation at home, what's going on at home, or not happening at home, mm -hmm. and then you have them being robotic or something scripted to over overly scripted, right? Sure. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then, is there anything else that could be relevant in a sales sabotage situation? If if somebody hasn't mastered the basics and they've gone after too many masters, okay, I'm trying to have too many coaches, right? Yeah, yeah. You're the coach. They need to listen to you, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, really important because. You do have more hours than anybody out there as a coach. So do you sort of have to almost tell them, look, you know what, you're going to be asked to buy all these people's products and services, and, but you know what, I really am your coach, and if you want to be, I mean, has this conversation yeah. ever come up? Yeah. Um, Monday in San Diego, I worked with some, some guys, and this was an older gentleman, and he started, we're role-playing, and he stopped, and he said, I've been through this guy's training, and this guy's training, and this guy's training. I said, hey, look, you know, just imagine for a moment we have a recipe and we're making chocolate chip cookies. You know, I love chocolate chip cookies, especially when they're warm, coming out of the oven. I see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so imagine we're making cookies. You're talking about enchiladas right now. Right. This is another recipe. We're not talking about that recipe. We need to talk about what we're talking about here. Let's do this formula. Don't worry about this stuff. This stuff is hurting you right now. Let's focus on making chocolate chip cookies. And I could hurt myself from having too many coaches, yes? Mm -hmm. True. Most definitely. It would probably be better to have one coach with a lot of experience versus many, perhaps other, yeah? Yeah. Okay, um, I got a whole bunch of questions for you. So many important things here. Um, we were talking about sales sabotage. Just go one step to the right. Let's say we've been not really sabotaging ourselves, but say that we're having a slump anyway. Sure. First of all, let's go back up now. Can you predict a slump? Let's, let's just stop there. Can you predict a sales slump? You can. You can first off not having goals. Okay. Okay. Um, knowing what's happening in life, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, change of a manager or owner of a company. Okay. Um, change of a product or service. Anytime that there's going to be an internal question of how do I make this work or what's changed, 
is going to create some issues and create some waves. All right, and that makes total sense because anytime you have change, you're going to change every piece of the system, right? Mm -hmm. True? Yeah. Okay, so so now that I've recognized, I mean, I'm in a sales slump and I'm, my sales really are terrible this month and I do need to pay the bills. Yeah. Now what do we do? Okay, first off, if there's a sales presentation, go through the whole sales presentation. There's a, there's right. a, this tendency happens with almost everybody that I've worked with. Um, let's say that things aren't going well for you right now, Kevin, and you have a presentation that's 90 minutes long. Okay. The first thing that salespeople and even entrepreneurs do is they, they cut out an element because they want to speed up the process so that they can get done faster, so right. that they can make up for the money that they lost. And this becomes just a never-ending cycle. So the first, the first go round, if it's an, a 90-minute presentation, they do an 80-minute. Okay. Um, they get to the end, and typically for them, it becomes a, uh, just a discounting plan. They're, I'm just going to make the quick sale. Uh, you know what, Kevin? Look, I'm having a tough time right now. Things aren't going well. Normally, this product's ten thousand. If you do it today, I'll do it for eight. And then you feel that nervous energy. Right. Okay. And then, so the next that call, does show desperation, right? Oh yeah, it okay. does. Yeah. Yeah, that desperation element's huge. Then the next thing is, is they did. They're supposed to do ninety. They did eighty. The next call, they do seventy. And the discounts get bigger and bigger and bigger. That desperation starts showing up, and the buyers just start going. I, mm, sounds too good to be true. And or, do you do you sit there and point that out then to them? Not during the call. Mm -hmm. After. Right. Uh, you know, sometimes when the, as an individual, if I feel the pain, it hurts more for me to know what's going on. If I'm sitting with a salesperson, I go, Hey, you know what? I can pinpoint exactly where you lost that call. Let's talk about it. Where do you think? Because I'm going to get them to talk first. I'm not going to give them all the information. They're not going to listen. I need them to have buy-in. So it's a matter of tell me, tell me what you think. Tell me what. Let's start with what went right. Let's talk about what went right. What did you do right? Because if we start on the negative, they're just going to get upset and they're not going to want to talk to me at all. So let's start. What went right? Let's figure out about four things that went right. So, do you ever record people uh, at, at your sales people um, with video camera? Uh, if the buyer lets us, because in California you have to ask. Right. Of course. Okay. Right. And sometimes they will. And so this is this is good to know. You know, recording people without their permission is illegal. Right. And it can cause a lot of problems, whether it's video or audio. Okay. So, I mean, uh, there's times where we'll put a, a tape recorder on the table and say, hey, look, you know what? I'm, I'm counting how many times I say um or ah or like, and I really want to get this down. Can we record this? I'll give you a certain amount of money off so I can go back and listen to it later and count how many times I'm, I'm making these mistakes. So those little nuances are significant in 2015. I, that's really interesting. They're, they're significant, but it gives you a good reason to allow that, that taping to happen. And... And just because of pure curiosity, so are people and people are okay with recording in their house? That's cool with them if you ask them sometimes. Uh, if money's involved, most oh, people will gotcha. say yes to anything. Okay, um, a couple other questions for you. Sure. Um, is there a drawback of going to a sales training or being in a sales training? There can be. There can be. Uh, we hit resonance with all sorts of different people. Yeah. And we have, as an individual, certain beliefs about what's going on. And so a drawback of some sales training is if it's unethical and uh, the person in the front of the room is Give me an example. Them. Give me an example of an, what, something unethical. Um, I've, I've heard trainers actually tell people to lie to their buyers just to get them to make the sale. Okay. And, you know, good sales training should push your boundaries, but okay. never ethical boundaries. Okay. Right? That's I, mean, a, I should make you uncomfortable a as a trainer. I should make you uncomfortable, but you should never go, I couldn't do that because I feel like I'd break the law. I, I mean, you should you should feel like, man, this guy's making me say stuff. I, I never really thought about saying it this way. I like it. Um, I'm going to have a tough time saying it, but I'm going to say it. Okay. Good advice. Once I've been with you for five years and you've gone on ride-alongs with me and I've gotten better over time, and I say, hey, I heard that trainer X is going to be at the Coliseum or at the hotel over here or at, a, at an event or whatever. Um, how do I know? Like, how can how can I predict a good sales training? How, how do I know that? A, a good sales trainer is going to have good content right off the bat. Okay. Not, it's not going to be like we need to slowly build up and slowly build. Up. They're going to they're going to give some nuggets right off the very beginning. So they're going to give you something that's tangible that you could use for the most part from the beginning. It shouldn't take all day to figure but out. But how, how do I know this. that before I get there though? Like how can I how can I get that data? Sure, you could you could look the person up online. You could take a look at their YouTube channel. Do they have one? You could take a look. So do they have something on the internet? You could take a look at their product list. Okay. So I've I've spent a ton of money a ton of money on internet products and Worth sales it? products. Some of them. 
some of them, a lot of them to answer your question though, were just built to get you to the next one. Yeah. Ah, okay. So product A is really mm -hmm. nothing more than a teaser. Yeah. And so the sales guy thinks that that $97 product is going to cut it, but the chances are that nobody's revealing all that much value for $97. Does yeah. that sound right? That's yes. about right. Okay. There's usually something around the, the two to $300 mark is where you're really going to find product that has content that you can use. I'm sure, don't get me, there's trainers out there that have some stuff out there, but at that $47 and $97, it's going to be tough to pull anything that's usable out of that. Okay. And at what point do you sit there and go, you know what, you are now ready for someone else's guidance in addition to mine. How do you, how do you help make that call for the guy? There's, there's a point when somebody has like a closing rate at, let's say, 30%. Yeah. It's easy to take somebody from 30 to 40 versus 40 to 45. Okay. Um, a lot of times when guys have come to me, they've been through so many trainings and so many processes, they're stuck around 35 to 40 percent. Okay. Um, there's not really anywhere for them to go after they work with me. There's not much training that's going to top off and get them to the next level. It's going to be from their abilities to talk to people, to ask questions, to stick to a process, and to be comfortable with what they're doing. Gotcha. And are there people... Um, out there who you just absolutely would hate for your guys to train with? Yeah. Yeah? yeah there's a couple of them and you know they, they uh, tend to uh, want to make the process more than what it is and it's highly manipulative. Got it. Yeah. Got it. And so once it comes down to, oh, you know what, let's close on this because you, the curiosity is, you, you know, we talked about you have 600 videos up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of videos. Not very many people do. Okay. So we found out that you want them out there because you want 600 doors being yeah. knocked down by the, yeah. your salespeople that are around 24-7, right? Yeah. That's good sense. I've watched your videos. Almost yeah. all of them are outside in Hawaii. Yeah. What's the story there? I mean, how, why? Okay, so I'm very fortunate. I go to Hawaii four to six times a year. And I just have this belief. I mean, it's cool to have a video indoor, but it would be way cooler to see, like, what's going on in the background? Right? There's people playing volleyball back there, there's some guys surfing, there's families running around having fun, and there's fun things going on behind me. It's not just a whiteboard. Whiteboards are cool, inside of a building's awesome, but it looks like there's fun things back there. Plus it makes it look like you know what you're doing because you're in Hawaii four to six times a year, right? Yeah. It's an interesting thought. Scott Bell Consultant Channel, you guys. Scott Bell Consultant Channel. We'll see you here next time around. Everybody take care.